<clears throat> How many people, by a show of hands real quick, have used containers or are, are at least a passingly experienced with containers in general? Good. How many of you have heard of the term ABAC, attribute-based access control? <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about both these things today. A um, little bit about myself. I come from a company called Divi. We're a startup down in Lehigh. We're changing how credit cards work. We're allowing you to get ahead of the transaction. It's kind of fun because you can generate virtual cards. So you can do like one-time purchase off virtual cards and it's just a lot more powerful of a interface. It's kind of modernizing credit card systems. I've been kicking around the tech industry for a while. I've been in various different positions from developer, engineer, CEO, CIO, CTO type stuff. And I've kind of thrown all this stuff together. I have a book out. I can talk to you about it offline if you want. It's called Activator. It's just around design thinking in the tech industry. Through all of these experiences, though, I've done a lot of stuff with systems and configuration and security. And the most recent thing I've been playing with is containers and the secrets and the challenges we have around those sorts of things. So I don't know if I'm holding this upside down or right, so we'll find out here. There we go. Before we really get into the reason that configuration secrets are a challenge, let's talk a little bit about containers. You've heard of the term ephemeral or ephemeral systems. And one of the reasons that people like containers so much is because they're kind of the holy grail of system administration. The way we used to do systems management was more like if you had a factory and a whole bunch of, you want to build cars in this factory, so you'd paint a whole bunch of parking spots and you would actually bring in a bunch of cars and fill up the factory like it was a parking lot. And then you would build robots to go out and put handles on every single car and then come back and then you'd tell them go out and change the paint color or whatever it is. That's kind of how we've done system administration up to now. Containers are really the, the uh, assembly line automation that is really in reinventing the industry. And that's why everybody's getting so excited about them. And it all boils down to being ephemeral. And the idea is that when you build this image of a container, you don't burn into that image anything that deals with system configuration stuff. And so when you create the image, you can sign it, you can scan it, and you can do a lot of stuff, but there's no sensitive data in the container. There's no configuration data in the container. And then you can promote it on through a pipeline if you're doing it right. A lot of people don't do it right because the challenge you have is the other side of this is you don't have configuration management in the container at runtime. You shouldn't be running a salt minion inside your containers. And um, that makes it challenging because you kind of have this catch-22, like I don't want to have config management in there, but I don't want to put secrets in there. And so <clears throat> what's happened is that it's people have just really struggled with this. And there's different solutions, and I'll get into them a little bit through the talk, but it's become a challenge for the industry. And, and just to really kind of make sure I hit all the elements, on the ephemeral system, if you look at a container and how things are going, you've got a couple elements that bring them together. And what these come down to is that you're going to have the stack or basically everything that runs your container. So it's going to be a little bit of the operating system. It's going to be your code base of, or what runs your code base. It's going to be like your, your Ruby or your Elixir or whatever it is that's driving it. That's the first kind of layer, and that's the basis for your container. Then you're going to layer into that. On top of that, you're going to put whatever code that you want to have run in that, con uh, that container. So if you're running an application, it could be your web code. If it, whatever it is, it goes in there as the second layer. And that kind of becomes what's your, your image that gets pushed through that ephemeral state. And then when you launch it, you should introduce your configurations at runtime, and then they should be talking outside the container to like databases to manage data. These are really the four elements that kind of make up a, a ephemeral stacked type container system. But the problem we're having is just like I was saying, getting those configurations in at that last time is a real challenge. And so it's all about where do we put those configurations. Now, if you if you've ever has anybody here struggled with this challenge before? I don't I mean, is it a if you've what what often happens is that you just put them in the environment variables because that's the easy thing to do. That's kind of like the fallback, but it's a really dangerous thing to do because you're, those environment variables, however they're actually stored, if you're using Kubernetes, if you're using just standard Docker, if you're using whatever it is, getting those delivered is not necessarily an easy thing. And so they've, they've, they've improved on it. And we'll talk about some of the things that are there, but some of the places you can put it is you could just burn it right into the image, but then you run into problems where You've got secret data stored in this offsite or wherever the repository happens to be for your container. 
and, and it also makes it no longer an immutable state. And so if you want to take that container image and promote it on up, you can't run the same container image in a development and in a staging and in a production because your configs are burned right into the image. And so that's really a, a anti-pattern. <clears throat> Putting them in the environment, there's challenges to that because environment variables, in fact, has anybody read the 12 factor manifesto? If you don't know what that is, go out and look at 12factor.net. It helps describe how to run things in a containered manner, but they're, it's very high level. And one of the statements they say is they say, um, put your configurations in the environment. I would contend that doesn't mean put them into the OS's and the processes um, environment space because those variables are actually not as secure as putting it right onto your, your process is gonna allocate its own memory and the, the variable space, basically where those stacks and heaps go. The OS environment area is actually a little more accessible and other processes can read into that and it's just not a safe place to be putting secrets. <clears throat> and it's also unmanageable and unwieldy, especially when you get longer and bigger key files and stuff, it just becomes really hard to man maintain. And so the latest thing has been you know, if you, Docker has added secrets to their system where they, you can generate a secret in the Docker data center controller, the universal control plane, and then it will go ahead and make that accessible to the container through a device file. You have to actually, so you write a script and then it reads from this device file that's been presented to the container and then it gets a secret that way. So you still need a startup script or something that basically runs before your application runs. The best, most ideal container is that you're going to actually have an entry point that says run node.js on this index.js file and like nothing else. So it's very thin, there's nothing, nothing in the intermediaries. And so putting a startup script in there is kind of, again, anti-pattern to that, but there's almost no getting away from it. This is kind of the best place to do it because it runs every time your container runs and you're, you're getting closer basically to the solution. And then the final one would be actually to rewrite your application just to read directly from a remote source. And so in uh, Node.js and some of these other stacks, you have config wrapping solutions that read different config files and it's kind of become a convention about how you can have different styles of configs kind of come together. And of these things, they're starting to actually allow you to read off of remote repositories. And so your application starts up and it reaches out to a remote repository to bring its configuration straight into variable space on the application stack. <clears throat> but this industry is still trying to figure all this out. It's, it's really struggled with the whole entire challenge. And if you ever get into trying to deploy these into a pipeline where you have a dev, a stage, and a prod, or whatever your pipeline would be called, you'll find the same challenge exists. And if you're getting into compliance, it also is a challenge because these secrets need to be locked down more so than even the application image because they're really the keys to the kingdom. So what we've got out there is I was just mentioning how Docker Secrets works. There is also HashiCorp has a tool called Vault. It does a key value store and it does encryption at rest and that sort of thing. So does Docker Secrets. It's a encryption at rest. Etcd can do encryption, and then the tool that I've that I came here to talk about is Reflex Engine. This is the tool that I've put together, and um, what Reflex Engine does that's similar to these other things, but it takes it kind of a step further. Is it also is looking at the whole service, and then it brings in attribute-based access controls. These other services we're talking about here, they're very much an implicit sort of thing, where it's a role-based access control. I mean, if you basically can get access to the system, you're kind of in, and there's a lot less fidelity over the individual granular level of controls. So just to hit a little bit, ABAC and RBAC, if you've not heard of attribute-based access control, this is what has been come up with to help address the Internet of Things. And the idea of attribute-based access control is that everything is an attribute. Instead of trying to, trying to say, let's figure out, let's, if, you, if you recognize the authorization, or identify authorization and then, or authentication and authorization, once you're authenticated in an RBAC world, you're kind of done worrying about what those attributes are and you just deal with authorization. In an ABAC world, those attributes are always relevant 
and they're, they should be analyzed anytime someone goes to access something, they become part of the authorization cycle as well. And a simple explanation of this is going to be if you think about the medical world and you have a role-based access control system managing medical records, you have a nurse working on the floor and she has the role of being nurse. She can log into that system from home and access patient data. She can log into that system while standing next to the patient and access patient data. And so this becomes a challenge and this is where the Internet of Things kicks in because if you add an RFID tag onto every patient's arm and then you put a proximity sensor on the kiosk that she's using to get into the records, that becomes an attribute saying she's within proximity of the patient and she has this attribute of being a nurse and those two things in combination allow her to access those records. But if she wanders off and goes home and tries to log in, she's no longer in proximity. She can't read that RFID tag as that attribute and so the AVAC would kick in and say, nope, you can't access those records. And that's kind of the concept of how, why this is such a thing. And, uh, and this is really still forming. There is not really any good standards around how to manage this and to think about it a different direction um, and what what I've done with uh, reflex engine if you think about querying who's who's written SQL before are we all passingly familiar with SQL okay when you get access to a database a SQL database you're going to authorize and authenticate to that database and then it's going to say okay I know who you are once you have that access if you go to query a table, it doesn't say, you know, per row, I'm going to decide what attributes you may or may not be able to see. You get access to the whole table. Now, you can do grants. Uh, you can grant like write access or read access, but you can't say, I want this person to be able to read these five rows, but not the other 20 rows. Like, you can't do that. <clears throat> With the ABAC that we've got in Reflex, there's Boolean logic that takes into account all of the attributes they've come to Reflex with. And so it's looking at the IP addresses that are coming in, it's looking at any certificates they might have come in with, their API keys, any sign-in that exists. And all of these attributes come together and you create a logical expression on the table saying, I want to authorize this said data that you're looking at based on if they're coming from my trusted network, that's one attribute, and they've got an API key, or they've got these different attributes that all come together, and then that decides on how it will release the secrets. And I've got a diagram that I'll kind of show that with a little bit more here in a sec. <clears throat> the key though with ABAC is that everything is an attribute. And once you start thinking about things that way, because even think multi-factor authentication, really it's just another form of ABAC. We're just adding those extra attributes together. And once you start adding attributes together, the quality of our security really just ratchets up through the roof quite a bit. Because just like the, the reason for MFA being there, it, it, uh, how many people have implemented MFA systems? Have you guys, have you guys talked about, um, has anybody talked recently about uh, SMS messaging? Is that MFA? This is one of the challenges I've been dealing with some of the coworkers I've got recently. I would contend that an SMS message sent to somebody is not an MFA in the true sense of MFA, but it is an ABAC thing because it's another attribute. But <clears throat> the difference is going to be in a true time-based key exchange system with MFA, what happens is somewhere out of band, you've, you've identified yourself and authenticated yourself to the service of question, and then you've both exchanged this time seed, and then you both go away and you say, if in the future, days, months, whatever, if I come together at the exact same time, the way that the seeds work, they know that the two seeds, will, that you'll always generate the same number and so they'll match. So the exchange only happens once at a time you've already been identified and authorized and authenticated. Whereas with the SMS systems, I'm, I'm just going off on the rails here, sorry. This is a hot topic for me right now. <laughs> with the SMS systems, um, what's really happening is you're saying, hey, trust me. And here's how you're going to trust me. You're going to come and sign in. And then after you've signed in, I'm going to say, here, here's a key code. Go ahead and give it back to me and I'll trust that you really are who you say you are. And it's like, that's not really MFA, right? And so anyway, that's a separate factor. It is still valuable. If they don't give you another option but SMS, then I guess go with it. But anyway, fun stuff with MFA. The other thing is that all these vaults that you create in the Internet of Things, everything's becoming more and more online, which makes things real challenging because 
if you have a build system that wants to do something and maybe it needs to pull down a key to sign stuff with and, and, and verify that all my data in my image has been signed properly and then it wants to put that back somewhere, like you still need to have a place to have all of your sensitive data. But do you want to take your vault, if you're running HashiCorp's vault, and put that publicly on the internet without anything other than just the standard vault access controls? I mean, that's kind of scary, and so most people hide these things away. And if you get back to what ABAC means, the, really, you should be able to take and just expose the whole thing out to the internet and just say, I'm going to rely upon all these attributes coming together properly to secure that system. So, just to kind of walk through how this could be, if you've got a configuration here, so I've got a secret, hey, it does work, I've got a secret back here, and I've got it behind an ABAC policy, and this policy says something to this effect, that basically says I've got an API key that's in my list of servers, and so I'm gonna go through and define a, a set of servers that I know I can trust, and I'm gonna give them an API key. And it, so this is going to be a pre-generated, like a jot, basically. And we're going to give it out to somebody, or out to a, a service stack. And then I'm going to say, I know that if they're coming from a 10.0 subnet, <clears throat> like that's my internal private subnet, and so I'm going to give that a little bit of credibility and trust in combination with the API key. And then on top of that, I'm going to actually pull the certificate ID off the SSL session, and so I'm going to do client-side certificates. And... I'm going to assign out a certificate. And so if those three things come together, then I'm gonna go ahead and trust that I should be able to give this set of secrets out to that, that whoever's requesting it and go ahead and do it. Or, you know, that's a Boolean expression. Maybe I'm gonna go ahead and pull a user ID. So I've taken a login session and I, I just trust the user ID by the time it gets to this level of the evaluation that the authentication's worked or it just wouldn't be there. And so that user ID is listed as one of the admins and the IP address is actually my VPN address, and so I'm delegating a little bit of trust there by saying that my VPN's already doing MFA, and so if they come in with a legitimate ID and they're coming off my VPN host, you know, and, and this gives you some control over that. You could also add in a policy that says, you know, I know that this block of internet addresses, I'm, it's kind of like a firewall almost. You say, I, I know this block of internet addresses, I'm gonna whitelist it and say, these are my build services from some SaaS provider and combine that with an API key or something, you know, to allow the scripting to work. And so it gives you a lot more control and power over those sorts of things. Some of these things you still can delegate up channel. You can have your firewalls doing some of these if you want multiple layers of security. It's not like a limitation. But the cool thing with this is you get to apply these policies at the role level. And so you describe how you want your secrets to look, and then you can have it be kind of selective about it. So you could have all of, all of your secrets in one database and you can set up different teams of people and different services and depending where they're coming from, they can access those things. So I think, it goes through some of this. <clears throat> so Reflex Engine, it's an open source project I've put together. Um, it is in its infancy, I'll be honest. I've been, this is some, it's running a couple production sites that I've worked on. But being open source, you know, we iterate and make things improve them a little bit over time. The main thing is that Reflex Engine, the difference between it and a HashiCorp Vault and etcd is that Reflex Engine takes a step back and it actually looks at the service itself. And so it's not just configurations, it actually has services mixed in with everything. And the reason that's powerful, actually, I've, I've been sitting down talking to um, Thomas Hatch from SaltStack about this same thing. Um, I want to try and get some of these things into SaltStack. And so he and I were talking through this. And if you think about the conventional world of container or of configuration management systems, they pivot around servers. That's really what they do is they work on servers. And they have a really, they really struggle when it comes to containers because they're the robot in that factory that I talked about earlier. So you've got this factory with the cars and it's running around, you have this corral of robots that goes out and they're really good about putting the doorknob on all the cars and then coming back and taking more instructions and going out. But like, we don't do that in the real world because that's actually highly inefficient. And we do assembly lines. And <clears throat> what's happening is in order to do that, the configuration management systems need to stop thinking about servers 
And then you start thinking about services. I have a group, a service that I'm addressing. And so when I was talking to Thomas, it was, it was a really fun conversation because, you know, the first impulse that most people from the config world have is they say, let's put salt minion on every one of the hosts that runs my container stack. Think of these as hypervisors if you're in the virtualization world. And then from there, it can reach inside the container and do stuff, you know, and there's like this little box with a question mark of what stuff would be, you know. And <clears throat> we had to go around a couple times to explain that that's kind of an anti-pattern. And even the idea of running a minion, it's like, well, then we'll just run the minion inside the containers. And so we'll have a salt minion in each container. And again, it's an anti-pattern because the way that salt or any of these other stacks work is they address servers. Once that container is running, it's ephemeral. You don't want to change it again. So there is this point when you launch that you should actually go in and fiddle with it and you can tweak it. But then you're kind of saying it's ready to go and now I have this live state and you don't go back in and change it again. And that's really configuration management is about the life cycle and changing it over time. And containers have no life cycle other than they're on and then you throw them away. And so you need to step back when you're talking about configuration management and you got to talk at a higher level, which is really going to be that service level. So what we're saying is I have a web service and that web service can have one container running or it could scale up to 15 or 300, back down to 10, whatever it is. Behind the scenes, there's a whole bunch of instances, but they're all ephemeral and really all my configuration is managed at the service level. And we had a really fun conversation. I think that there's going to be some good changes coming out of Salt. I think we're going to start seeing some service level addressing. Who, who's used Salt before? Anybody? So I'd, I'd, I'd like to think we can get some of these concepts even into Salt where you can start to address things at the service level and say, I want to put a database secret, but it's going to be the same database secret for every container, right? You're not going to have to go into every single container classic ways you'd go into every single server and you'd put that config out there for your database secret and this way you put the config in one place on the set on the service and then when the containers launch they pick it up in addition to that <coughs> it gives you some fun polymorphism because you're changing even the entry line the entry point so on a container you give it an entry point and you will say either run my startup.sh or you know, I was just looking through some of the Docker data center pieces and they're just using entry.sh now. And so the idea of the entry points kind of changed. Originally, when the container world started, the entry point would be your code that you would launch and still a lot of people do that. And it's changing now. So with Reflex Engine, it, it, we've got a launch command and the launch command, you basically say, my entry point is going to be launch. And that's about all you got to say and you put three environment variables on the container and nothing else. One of those variables says where the reflex system is at, it's a REST API. The other variable is an API key and then the third variable is gonna be the name of the service in reflex. And so when you run launch, it goes out and it finds that service and then that service gives it its identity, assuming that the image itself has what it needs to run. And the fun thing about that is if you have a node application and you've got, it's running web services, <clears throat> you might launch it a certain way that fires off node index.js for general web processing. But if you have a job that has to run once a day and just do a little bit of batch processing and you want to just bind that into the same code base because you don't want to create a whole entire new image and have a whole new node modules and all the dependencies because it's really the same thing, it just needs to run this batch. You can take that same image and just give it a different service name and that different service name now says, instead of running node index.js, it says run node batch.js. And so it gives you that kind of polymorphism without even having to go in and hack on the container. You don't have to change your shell scripts anymore and it, it lets you do all that at the, a little more flexibly. It's also because it's a REST-based interface, it's addressing the concepts of infrastructure as code have you guys heard that? I'm sure that term's been bandied around a little bit. Um, I think it's a hard term for some people to grasp because automation is not necessarily infrastructure as code. And I've, I've kind of been the rounds with a few people on this. Um, a lot of the configuration systems that are out there, most people say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and put all of my puppet configs into GitHub because then they're versioned and they're stored. That is not infrastructure as code because 
<clears throat> those configurations are very hard to mutate and change. You can't programmatically very easily script against something that's in a GitHub repo because you have to do a checkout, you have to go and mangle some files, you have to do a check back in, and then you have to go ahead and get it back out to the puppet. Or yeah, it just it's not as flexible as if you have a live state where you can just programmatically query an API, make changes, and let that kind of cascade on out. <clears throat> Got ahead of myself here. And then continuous delivery is what this also helps you with. A lot of the config management systems also struggle around um, pipelines. So you have a development environment and a testing environment and a staging and a QA and whatever your pipelines look like. That's usually the last thing people kind of address. What we're bringing to the table here is it has this concept of a pipeline built right into it. You have pipelines and services. And that is when you really get into doing DevOps and better security is when, when security becomes built into the fabric instead of an afterthought someone puts in at the last second because compliance people came by and said you can't do it in environment variables. That's really what this is trying to address is saying security first and if you do it right then you don't have to deal with a lot of like these uncomfortable questions that come up later because invariably they will once the auditors come through and say, I don't know if that's such a good idea to put that in an environment variable. I think, actually, I did. I'm going to actually pop through. I think I've got some other slides here to talk about. I didn't know how long this was going to go, guys. So this talks about inside reflex, the kind of the different objects you would have, and I've talked through a little bit of these. <clears throat> it keeps track for you of, or sorry, you build services, and then those services are part of a pipeline. And then you have configurations that tie to that, and then it will keep track of the instances for you. So like every time you run launch, that actually reaches out to Reflex to grab its configurations, Well, it also keeps track of its instance information. So even though that wasn't part of the design, there's actually even a little bit of service discovery, which, is, which can be a little bit challenging in the container world, quite a bit, if you've ever dealt with it. So that's actually not an advertised feature, but it is one of the things that kicks in there. You can query the instances. Um, before I really go deep dive on this, I actually just want to ask you guys, I mean, what do you think about what I've talked about thus far? We've got some time to Q&A a little bit, and I can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper on these things if you want. Attribute-based access control, what are your thoughts on that? Any questions on ABAC? If this is the first time you've heard of it, I don't know. It's a challenge. ABAC is a challenge, I would say, because roles are easy. You have a group. You put people in a group, you're done. ABAC is, is Boolean logic, and how you get that associated can be challenging. Um, what about container secrets? Have you guys, what kind of war stories? Does anybody have any war stories with trying to deal with secrets in containers? Anybody? You want to share anything? Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think you're asking, um, I'm trying to rephrase what you're saying for everybody's sake. So you were asking the idea of saying that the launch script will run other stuff. And how does the services, like if you're running Kubernetes or Docker Data Center or one of these other ones, how do they keep track of that? Is that what you're asking? <clears throat> so it is still following the principle of one-to-one. -one. And so when launch runs, the polymorphism is only for the current state. It won't create another one. It actually runs an exec and it disappears from the picture after the service runs. And so the stack is actually that Docker spins up a new container, which is just a process, and the, I'm going to actually wonder if I should pull, I got another presentation on Docker that explains the layers of Docker, but so it fires up another process, and that process then is, it, this is, right now it's in Python, and so it runs the Python binary, the Python binary runs launch, and launches the script, the script goes out, reaches out, pulls in the secrets, now this is actually the other kind of fun thing about this is, because it's at runtime, it's not in the container's environment. And so if you actually, you can attach to a container out of band and you can get a shell 
there's actually no secrets that show up there if you do it that direction, which is another nice thing about this. So anyway, the process runs, it goes out, grabs the secrets, brings them into the space, and then after it's configured and done all the secrets the way that however you want, and it has inheritance, it has a lot, you can write files, you can dump files, you can change macros, you can do a lot of stuff with it. Then it runs exec. And so the Python binary is dumped out of memory. All the reflex stuff is now gone from the equation, and now it's just your application after that. And so there, if you wanted, the polymorphism would actually come at a higher level, where you would go in, into your tool, if it's whatever tool it is, and you would buff, define a different binary, and you would just be able to reference the same image. That's the, the polymorphism is at the image level. And if you, and so, actually, I kind of want, I, I'm feeling like I kind of want to jump in and actually pull up another presentation on Docker. And I'm, I'm trying to resist that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> There, the, one of the biggest challenges, I wrote a blog post recently, one of the biggest challenges with containers is that there is so much, because they're so game-changing, there's a ton of technologies out there, and so it's hard to just go in and get your toes wet. Like, you kind of have to go into the deep end, and that's what has caused a lot of challenges with people is that it's hard to do the whole thing, and there's a lot of different technologies out there that are all trying to deal with a lot of these challenges. And so like the service management side of things can be a challenge for sure. I think Amazon has put together a solution that's really painful, personally speaking. Um, Kubernetes is a great solution, but it's, there's a lot of open source to it, and so it's a lot less, it, it's not as polished, right? Um, Docker's working on the solution that theirs has a lot of polish, but it's a little bit unstable. There's a lot of peripheral systems out there. Nanobox.io has some local ties, if you've ever seen that one. Um, what are some of these other ones out there? You've got Rancher. You've got, uh, I can't remember half these names. There's a bunch of other, there's a, there's a huge community of people that have built systems to try and manage containers. And I would say, don't go against those systems. Like, this is meant to be... a a thin little layer that you can just insert into the middle of that without really disrupting the flow. Because I'm, I'm not trying to solve everything, just trying to enhance it, hopefully. So, I don't know if that answered your question or... Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's an anti-pattern. So the, the, the statement is the fusion image, you know, you don't have a good container unless you've got syslog and some of these other parts to it. And I would, I would contend the opposite. You're really making me want to pull up this other presentation on ephemeral systems, but... <laughs> um, any other thoughts on this, reflex and that? Yeah, back here. Yeah. So the question is, how do you, how do you separate the, the people who want to use the, have a config system that brings their configs in and the secrets that come in? How do we make this? Because people don't want to deal with two systems and they want to bring it in, uh, manage it in one place, but you don't want to put all the configs in one place. You don't want to put all the secrets in one place necessarily. And so this can be kind of a confusing challenge. Is that what you're asking? <clears throat> So how I have dealt with it is I wrote Reflex Engine. Um, and what, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what Reflex Engine does is it actually brings them into one place. 
you don't need to have a config management system anymore because it's actually a really powerful configuration management system. It's all JSON objects and you can do some inheritance. And I didn't go, I don't have any of the examples up here because I didn't know how deep we would want to go with this. And so I can talk to you out of band if you want. But it was easier, like that, that very challenge you talk about how people don't want to use multiple systems. That's the problem with the container world is like everybody has very niche solutions. And I was trying to balance out what is the niche I'm trying to fit with what's the most convenient, like usable use case around that. And so that's why I brought the configs in. It's like rather than having configuration be separate because now every single service that runs has to have kind of this confusing complex init script. I just brought it all together into one place and I pivoted it off the service level and it brings all of your configurations in. I've run monolithic Java applications with this where it goes out and it will dump in um, key, key store files. So we it was working with a service where we're interfacing with grants.gov and to every university would have to have a, a key. That's the authorization system that they use with grants.gov or these email PKI keys. And every university has a unique key assigned to them that's been registered with them. And so every time they go to do a grants.gov transaction, they got to hand this over and it's stored in a Java key store file. And so every container for each of these universities we were hosting would have to have a unique key store file, but I, you can't burn that in the image, right? You'd have hold 70 some odd images or keys. So we, and we only wanted one key store. We didn't want University of X's key store to be in University of Y's, you know, because then accidentally send the wrong grant to the wrong place. And so <clears throat> what we do is we've stored the key store right in the reflex database and it's a secret, but it's not the same as like a database password. And then when it runs, it goes ahead through the inheritance and all the different things that Reflex has and it pulls just the, because the service would be named for University X and it would launch up and, and would bring that one key store file right into the repository and write it out along with all the properties files and whatever else is needed. And so like with the properties files, I ended up just templating them. So the repository or the image that the Docker image that's created has a templated file that follows the variable substitution pattern. So it can be checked into GitHub and they can just see it because there's no secrets there. It's just a bunch of template match, you know, sequences. And then when it runs, Reflex is told, here is a template file, process it, and then spit it out in this location with all the secrets in it. And then Java goes ahead and reads it. I've actually done one more thing with Reflex because I don't even like writing configs to disk. Uh, that alone, the whole ephemeral nature, I don't like that. And so Reflex will also do this config flattening because all of its configs are stored in a JSON format. And so you have this deep dictionary structure you can use and it will go ahead and bring all this together, flatten the inheritance hierarchy and you can tell it, just write it to standard in on my process. And so when your process starts, instead of looking for disk for something, it just reads standard in, it gets a JSON blob and that's all its config data is there and you can take off and run. So now you're not even bouncing secrets off disk if you wanted to use that option. It does require you change your app a little bit. Not all apps can handle that, of course, but um, any other thoughts? Yeah, in the back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you cannot change the application to read from like a standard in, I mean, standard in is the best I've come up with. Um, otherwise, I think what you're doing off RAM disk is actually a great way of doing that because it keeps it in memory and as long as you close it out afterwards, you're going to be safe. Um, the best thing would be to just get the application because this is a REST interface. So we have this launch script I talked about. I'm working on improving the libraries. So these different libraries, if you're running Python right now, you can actually just load up RFX. So the way to install Reflex, it's actually a Python module. You just um, pip install RFX CMD to get the command side of it. But you can just pip install RFX and then just run RFX.client. You can just go right out and just grab these things direct and live and just do it through that interface instead. It depends on the application and your mileage will vary, of course, because now you're fundamentally, you're, you're more tightly coupling the application to a service like this. And there's going to be pros and cons to that, of course. So, other thoughts? Yeah. Mm. 
<clears throat> yeah, it is a chicken and egg thing. Well, so it's JOT. Who's familiar with JSON Web Tokens? Some people. So JSON Web Token, it's a really cool construct. I think JOT.org might be, no, JOT.io, I think is where it's at, JWT.io. And so the API keys are JOTs. Now, I think a lot of, <clears throat> the problem with an API key is that the general concept of an API key is not authentication, it's identification. It's saying, here, this is a key, and, and you're going, yep, that's a key. <laughs> you don't really know for sure if the bearer of that really is who they should be. And <clears throat> that can be a challenge. And so the, the way that I've set it up, um, I would love to even, I have a ladder diagram of it somewhere. So what happens with JOTs is they have three parts. If you ever go look at a JOT, go to JOT.io and look at it. They're broken into three parts, split by periods. And the first part is going to be a base 64. And I'm going deep because I figure we've got a lot of people who like to go deep on some of this tech stuff. But there's three parts to it. The first part says, this is the cryptography I'm using. Second part is, here's my payload. And the third part is um, a signature. And what's neat about that is the cryptography says, basically, this is the type of signature. And you kind of put anything you want in the payload. And so the way that the API key works for reflex is I don't, the API key itself is actually two parts. It's an identifier for the user and then a secret. And the secret never goes on the wire. What you do is you use that secret and it generates a jot. It takes the jot, hands it off to the, to the reflex server. The reflex server then actually creates a session secret that's exchanged in this process. And then it asks the client to keep using the session secret for all the rest of the jots until the session expires. But the long and short is <clears throat> to answer your question, you know, can you really trust the API key? You, you can't fully trust just an API key. You should do more, and I'm not sure if that's ask, answering your question or not, but... Mm -hmm. That is passed through. So, the API key and the reflex engine URL are set as environment variables. And then the rest of those attributes come in from the query session. And so when launch runs, it's going to connect up. So like if you did a cert, you would need to also put that cert in the environment so that it would go upstream. And so there is still some challenges with that. You're kind of de deferring some of these things. And so that's where the different pieces like a certificate and stuff, I'll be honest, I haven't gotten too deep into the certificate because I haven't seen much value of a cert over just the API key because the API key is kind of doing a lot of the same sort of things, where you have the signed key that's kind of, and that's really all you're getting out of a certificate. The value of doing client-side certificates, and the reason I've got it in the mix, is because it helps you address man-in-the-middle sort of things on the TLS session more than anything. So it just depends on how, how secure you want it to be. And it's an emerging technology, and so there's going to be, you know, we've got a, this ABAC thing in general, you know, people are still wrestling with, so... Thanks, though. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Client-side certificates. Right. The client-side certificate would be the TLS session certificate for the client, instead of it being server-sided only. I didn't catch that. Do I allow what? Pinned, P-I-N-N-E-D. <clears throat> um, I haven't really got my head into the pinned stuff. I mean, I know they've been recommending pinned lately. I'm wrestling with it. Like, I understand the logic and the argument, but some part of my soul still says this doesn't feel right. And I, I can't say why, and so I've got to get my head into the pinned certificates more. Um, I mean, pinning a certificate really is just bypassing the third-party delivery of the CA verification, if I'm wrong. Am I missing on that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <clears throat> so let me, for everybody else's sake, let me talk a little bit about pinning. We're just going to meander our conversation all over the place. We got time. <clears throat> so who has who has heard of certificate pinning? Has that been discussed recently here? Okay, so a, a mix of people. I think that um, at a high level, the idea is that there's this great infrastructure of all these different CAs that are out there, and we've delegated trust that if we get a legitimate CA to sign it, that we're probably trusting whoever it is, and that, that's all the onus of responsibility is only on the server side to get a good CA. And if someone registers anything they want with a good CA, like our app is going to trust it. And so pinning is basically saying, somehow i got to scope down that trust and I do it either by just embedding certificates in my app and only trusting the CAs that are embedded or by scoping it to just a set of CAs I trust. And that helps address the man in the middle because the issue here is that people can put proxies in the middle of your session and they can, you, they, you won't even necessarily notice it's happening because of the way that the TLS session works. Your client will go out and connect up like some of these public Wi-Fi's can do this easily and they'll intercept it and they'll actually pretend to be the server and they'll have a signed certificate from somewhere that lets them do this and your client just trusts it, they decrypt the session, they look at all your payload, they turn around, re-encrypt it and connect it out to wherever you want it and then send it back to you through and you don't necessarily, you can't even detect this has happened in some cases. And so client side certificates I believe can also address that problem because the, ah, I can't remember how that would work though, I'm spacing off, I need to get launch time here. <coughs> So pinning is something I've been meaning to investigate further. I haven't really spent too much time on it, to be honest. Uh, the idea of the CA being a trusted thing, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'll have to look into that more. So other questions, thoughts? Do you guys want me to do any more deep diving on Reflex in general? Or if you want, maybe I'll just go ahead and uh, wrap it up and come talk to me privately and I can actually show you some real live examples if that works. And if you guys have any questions, actually, the other one, um, I love my book. <laughs> um, I just got it. We just released it two month, two weeks ago, and so it's up on Amazon. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. And if you have any questions, come on up and talk to me. And feel free to link up with me on LinkedIn and keep the dialogue going. And if anybody wants to help with the Reflex project, feel free to reach out to me and talk to me as well. So thanks a lot. <laughs>